Hi students, in today's lecture we will discuss the defensive principles. We will go through the five principles that we outlined for defending. It's the pressure or delay, depth or cover, balance, patience and compactness. I will tell you a little bit about every single one with examples and uh, also we will discuss the differences between two types of defending man-to-man -man defending and zonal defending. Let's begin! So the first principle we will discuss today is called pressure. So pressure comes into two different forms, the way I see this, and it's really based on what we are trying to achieve. In some cases we are using pressure to win the ball back right away, in other cases we will use pressure to deny the opponent their offensive action or take away their space. So usually pressure happens in response to uh, a defensive transition. So if you're thinking of the moment of the play and we will cover more of those, this is when we had the ball and we just lost the ball and that's when we need to apply the pressure that's most common. Also pressure can be applied when we are out of possession, we are defending as a full team. So a few things to consider. For the purposes of this lecture we will always be the blue team and red team, they will be the attackers. So if we are going through uh, case one where we have to apply pressure to delay the opponent's action, here is a situation that, that could arise. Let's say the opponents have the ball, they're going 2v1, our teammate is out of position, she or he need to recover, so we can apply the pressure to the opponent to give our teammate time uh, to get back. Now a very important thing is how you apply said pressure. So in this case usually you will hear a coach saying the first player to the ball has to get as close to the ball as possible. If this player is closer to the ball than the uh, teammate and he or she runs all the way here, it's very easy to see that this player can be beat with a pass and that this pressure is kind of wasted. So in this case, that would be a good example of delaying the pressure. So for delay, you want to get in the pass between your opponent and the goal, but not too close to the ball. So this way you're forcing the uh, delayed reaction from the opponent, so you're denying the time that he or she needs to get uh, through you, and you're giving your teammate the time to make what's called a recovery run. So in this case, here's where the pressure would be, that's the position, while the uh, teammate recovers goal side and then you can apply the pressure and the teammate will provide something that we will talk uh, about, this will be uh, called cover. Now the second type of uh, pressure that can be applied is when you have enough players behind the ball, so you're in no danger of being out, outmatched by them, let's make it a little more realistic, and here you would like to win the ball as high up the pitch as possible. So you can see this is the closest player to the ball, it's important to know who should apply the pressure and also it's important to know what kind of technical abilities you have. For example, if we know that this player is really disciplined, has really good tackling habits and tackling techniques, knows about the speed of approach, the position, where she should be, and I will cover all of these in a minute, in a minute uh, he or she will be more uh, successful in uh, applying this at pressure. So here this player can go to the ball, but look, it's not really enough just for one player to apply the pressure. And you've seen many games on TV probably where one of uh, the midfielders or the striker presses the ball and then nobody goes with him and that creates sort of a frustra frustrating situation for the uh, defending team. So not only the player who is closer should apply the pressure, the other teammates should get higher up closer to uh, him or her to be in good positions as well. A few things that, uh, that are worth taking into account here. First is obviously field awareness. Where on the pitch are we that we can apply the pressure appropriately? For example, if we are all the way on the opponent's half, we can be a little more aggressive with the pressure that we apply, while when we are on defensive half, uh, we have to be a little more cautious about space in behind us. Uh, a good concept that we use here is called the line of confrontation. So the line of confrontation, this is an imaginary line on the field, it could be anywhere actually, it could be just above the top circle, I mean the central circle, it could be closer to your own half, it could be the halfway line. 
The notion is that we as a team had the discussion before this uh, game, before the match, and we agree that we will give the opponents all the time and space they need above the uh, line of confrontation. But the moment they cross this line, this is go season, so everybody applies the pressure and we try to win the ball. In modern games, if you watch professional football, teams like Man City and Liverpool, their line of confrontation is pretty high. They're trying to win the ball as soon as they can. Could be uh, as high as the top quarter of the pitch, so the opponent's, uh, opponent's defensive quarter. Uh, in youth game, usually it's either the halfway line or just the top of the uh, central circle. Uh, another thing to consider when you're applying the pressure is communication. As I mentioned before, it's not enough just for one player to get uh, to the opponent with the ball. So having a keyword uh, for the whole team that you can all apply and, uh, and execute uh, would be key. For the teams that I coach, usually we use press or repress. And the whole team knows that when uh, the teammates yell repress or you may hear the coaches from the bench calling for a repress, this is their time to get high, get in the opponent's face and uh, win the ball uh, when they can. Now, our second defensive principles we will be discussing today is called depth or cover. So this is really not about the player who's applying the pressure. This is the player that supports this player. Usually you would hear this also uh, called as a support defensive action. So here is the situation. The opponent has the ball and we have the closest player applying the pressure to the ball. Now, two things can happen. If the defensive player is more successful, he or she will win the ball and uh, defending is done at this point. We're going into transition to attack. The second thing that can happen is the attacker is better than the defender and he or she can get around the defender. And then they can have an opportunity on goal. So in soccer, we would use a secondary defender who will be making sure that this situation never happens. And if the first defender gets beat, there is somebody in the way between the attacker and the goal. So a few things to note for the depths and cover. Uh, First one is absolutely critical. This is the position on the field. So if this player is applying the pressure and the supporting player, the player providing the cover, is here in line with the defending player, he or she will not be successful or useful for that matter if the attacker is able to beat the defender. Same happens if they're way too deep and behind the defender. If the first defender gets beat, really, they have to defend again. It's better than being in line, but still not good enough. So usually we use the rule of 45 and 10 for this. 45 meaning the angle when you are supporting a player, you are aiming to be at a 45 degree angle from the player uh, in relation to the direction of the run of the attacker. So this is your angle. And this distance should be about 8 to 10 meters or usually a goal width apart. Now, in this case, communication is critical because the player that's applying the pressure, he or she are busy. They are only concerned with the ball and making sure to delay this action. They do not have the time to look back behind them to figure out whether the supporting player is and which way to show the attacker. So showing the attacker means that you want the attacker to go a specific way. So if there is no communication to the pressing player from a supporting player, player providing depth and cover, and the pressuring player shows the opponent the wrong way, the opponent could exploit this space here, and it will be a long distance for a secondary defender to run to get the ball. So before this thing even starts, we are looking for communication from the player providing the cover. Show her left, or show him left, show her right. This gives a clear information to the pressing player how to position their body shape to ensure that the attacker go the way that is predictable for their supporting player. So in this case, the goal would be uh, show him left. The pressing player will position himself a little bit to the angle, forcing this player out here. Now, the second thing that the covering player is looking for is an opportunity to win what's called the second ball. So if the pressing player scares the attacker a little bit or has a touch on the ball and forces a bad touch out of the attacker, this ball can become loose and roll into space. Attacker would be immediately chasing it, but defender has an upper hand because he or she is expecting this sort of behavior. They can get to the ball first, 
get into space and transition into uh, attack. This is, this is that. Another thing that's very important to consider when we are providing cover is creating the numbers up situation. So always we want to have a 2v1 or a 3v2 which will boil down to v one situation when we are providing the cover. Because we feel confident when we have friends helping us and that's, that's how we would like uh, to play defending. Also, an important bit is at the higher level when you are 12 to 16 you start to learn this it's changing of the roles. So, back in the day, if we're talking in 1960s, 1970s, if this striker, this attacker, would beat the first defender, he or she would go on and probably they will be met with another defender. Now, usually this defender would do nothing. They would just turn around, watch the play as it happens, and not even, not even wink an eye. So, in this uh, modern day football, since things change, things change drastically. Here, we'll put them back, back in together. After you get beat, you're no more considered to be the primary defender, so your supporting player could step up to win the ball. Your job is getting into right supporting position yourself, providing that 8 to 10 meter distance at a 45 degree angle, so you perform what's called a recovery run. This is key. This way, these two players can move indefinitely, almost indefinitely, spaces to the subject, giving support to each other, trying to win the ball, making an attacker's life much harder than it needs to be. So sometimes the attacker thinks, oh, I, I will beat one player, maybe I will beat two players, then I will have a go at goal. If you switch the roles all the time, he or she will need to beat many players that are basically you two just moving in the right sequence. For our next defending principle, today we will be discussing balance. So with pressure and support, we are clear on what the job of the first and secondary defenders are. Providing support, communicating, figuring out which way you want the attackers to go. But as you get older, 12 and up, things change a little bit. And here's the biggest difference that I see as a coach coaching U8, U10 to U12 and up. At U8, U10, balance is a very hard concept to teach because everybody wants to be close to the ball. So kids and players, they tend to bunch up around the ball, creating this thing where, which I call the Timbits, Timbits soccer, Timbits football, where the ball is at the center of the attention and everybody is around it, moving like a big blob. But eventually, eventually, as the players develop and mature, they will discover that if you're not part of that blob, and if you choose to stay a little wider, if the ball gets kicked out and gets to you, you really have nobody around you, so you can just have a go and maybe score a goal. As the older players develop, they have discovered this thing long ago, and they're a little more patient and structured in how they play, so usually they would provide wids as attackers. We will use just two attackers for this uh, case. So the red attacker with the ball will be moving on this side, and the wids will be on the other side of the ball. For example, if this is the pressing player that's the supporting player, a simplest play here would be a pass. And then this player will go on the post if we don't have anybody on that side of the field. So we introduce the concept of the balance player. This is the third player that ensures that this space is being managed. He or she is not close to the attacker that is uh, in, the, in space, but far away so they are between the attacker and the goal, and that they can manage to become the pressing player as soon as the pass is played, that they can get there. Or, better yet, if this pass is happening, they can run in and intercept. Now, how do we think about balance? And depending on how your team plays and what age you are, it could be different. The simplest way that I consider this, I divide the field vertically in half. And then, depending on your position, you have different jobs, different restrictions, I would say. So, for example, if you're one of the central players, uh, center backs, box-to-box -box midfielders, attacking midfielders, striker, you can go to any part of the field and be part of the defending unit. 
But if you are a wing back or a winger, my job for you is staying on your own half. So in this case, let's say this is a wing back and the play happens all the way here. I'm going to provide support from this side now. So 45 degree angle, first defender, second defender. My balance player is allowed to come up only to the middle. And create this. It almost looks like a like a curve thing with balance player, support player, and pressure player. Now, even if this pass happens across, he or she is still deep enough to move and meet the attacking player. So this is good. But also, she or he is not on this half to make it impossible to move in time. So one of the coaches that they work with, Coach Jean, he has a great analogy for, for this idea of balance. So we think of the soccer pitch as a boat, and this middle line is the center of the boat. If our whole team moves to one side of the boat, the boat would tip. So in a way, us having a winger and a wing back on the other half of the boat prevents the boat from tipping. And boat tipping for us is getting the whole team out of balance and maybe creating an opportunity for the attackers to exploit the space and get a shot on goal. Now, let's talk about some key things that we need to consider uh, when we're talking about balance. So first things first is mental engagement. It's very easy for the player providing the balance, the third player, to daydream a little bit and just watch the play and not be in the right position. So this creates a very dangerous opportunity for uh, the attackers by playing a pass just across the line of support into an oncoming runner who can exploit the space in between. So as you see here, this is not a good position because the supporting player couldn't get the ball and the balance player uh, was lagging behind. So the way we will think about this balance player and uh, her or his position is again in meters. So we spoke about 10 meter, 8 to 10 meter here. We will have 8 to 10 meter distance between a supporting and a balancing player. Now angle is also very important. If this player is forming a straight line with uh, support and pressure, this pass becomes equally as dangerous because in a way we are taking out two players out of commission. So the only way you can defend this is by your balance player becoming the pressure player and these two players making your recovery run. So the 45 degree angle from the supporting player is where your balance player would like to be. Now let's talk about patience as our fourth defensive principles. This is something that is sort of hard to, uh, to talk about using the magnets, but very easy to describe. So for patients, we are being aware of time and space. So time, for example, um, what part of the match is it? Is it the end of the first half? And uh, it's a nil-nil. Usually you would see that statistically a lot of goals are scored in this, uh, this period. Or maybe it's just the beginning of the half and uh, the teams are still asleep after the, uh, well, the halftime talk or the start of the match talk. Maybe this is the 90th. Second 93rd minute of the cup and we are up by one and we have to preserve our lead so all these things factor into patience and patience in defending is key because attackers are trying to get us out of balance us shifting together as a team providing proper pressure support and balance is key patience applies to individual skill as well as we are watching the ball as a pressing player when is a good time for us to take a touch and step in and try to win it Will we give the attacker multiple attempts to do fancy foot skills and watch for the time when they have just a bit touch, bad enough for us to get the toes on the ball and kick the ball out? Um, patience also deeply ties into discipline. So discipline as in, should you come out? Should you become the pressing player? Is this the good time for you to delay the action or would you need to press right away? Uh, usually... Space on the field is also important. For example, if you are playing a center back, 
and this is a defensive midfielder, for example, and this will be a winger that was left up there in attack, and the opponent is exploiting this space here. Should you come out? And if so, by how far? These are all the answers that your coach will give you. In the games that I play, sometimes I ask my center backs to manage the space and only come out as wide as the width of the uh, penalty areas. Basically, standing in between the attacker and the goal, but not really being drawn out. Because if she gets drawn out, maybe there is a midfielder, attacking midfielder, that will get the ball and try to exploit the space. So we'd like to make it predictable and managed for them. And here, because she's providing the delay, in a way, waiting for the winger to get back and provide the back pressure, patience on this player means not being uh, baited out of her, of her zone. Our last defensive principle for today is compactness. So compactness is very easy to illustrate with magnets, and that's exactly what we will do. You know that one of the attacking principles that teams use to find space is called widths, being really wide from line to line, so they can move the ball around, trying to get into space behind the defense. Now, if defenders match the same widths, it's immediately obvious the spaces that this creates. First of all, gone are the support and balance principles because this distance and angle is definitely more than 45 degrees and the distance is more than 10, 10 meters. So if this player gets beat, there is no hope for a recovery unless this player is super fast. Even then, it becomes a very dangerous affair. So compactness was introduced to make sure that we stay together at the proper distances. Now here is proper support, proper balance. Life is good. What happens if the ball moves? Usually, the attackers are trying to get us out of the defensive shape. But we, as defenders, we will employ the principle of compactness and we will shift. Maybe this becomes the pressing player, becomes supporting player, and we will keep the distances close enough. As the ball travels to the other side, we can shift again and have the right curve, the right angle, and if the ball shifts to the middle, back we are. So compactness is really easy to think about. Do not let the ball pass through your defending line. And when you are being coached, sometimes you hear coaches uh, giving you these objectives for the match. It's, uh, for example, the three midfielders or the uh, center backs and the defensive midfielder. You get points for intercepting passes that were penetration passes through your lines and you lose points if you let the ball go through. For me, in my experience, challenging players like this, this is the simplest way of ensuring that they have something that they can easily uh, identify as a success or failure. Success would be this pass being intercepted. Be a, pass. a failure would be this pass going through and then a goal scoring opportunity is created. Also, it becomes like a mini game inside the game. When you're playing this, have a little have a little chat with your defensive partners, with your uh, defensive midfielder if you're playing a center back, and see if you can deny the space inside this triangle. So think about your defensive unit as a triangle. And basically, you turn this into a no-go zone. Nobody's allowed in. The ball will get intercepted, players will get managed. That's the idea of uh, compactness. It's really about the team unity, moving together, importance of communication big time, because you would like to ensure that your teammates are aware of what you do. And by that, the easiest way of doing this is yelling out the position that, uh, or the job that you will do. If you're moving out to meet the oncoming player, you will yell that you are pressure, then the second player will be support, balance, no problem, everybody knows what happens, and you maintain your shape when you shift together. As the ball travels, that becomes your shape, so you're defending well. Now for our last defending principle today, it's not really a principle but very important bit to talk about, it's the differences between men marking and zone marking. The easiest that I can explain it is the example of the corner kick. So red team has the right to do a corner kick and they have some players inside the box, uh, a kick taker, and then the blue team has to defend. So here is the difference. You hear coaches yelling at you all the time, 
pick a shirt, pick a shirt, or pick a player, or man mark. This means that in this defensive scenario situation, you are responsible for a specific player, like these three players here. If this player goes, you follow him or her. And sometimes you see other types of defenders, they are standing in the post or standing inside the goalkeeper area, depending on your defensive organization, and they're not really tracking any specific player. Instead, their job is marking a little bit of space, and coach asks them is not let the ball land inside your marked area. So for example, if this ball gets played here, maybe this defender can step up and head the ball wide. The difference is if the ball gets played here, maybe this defender can win the ball or press the player so he or she cannot have the shot at the goal. And this is the easiest way to think about this. If you have a player you're responsible for on your go with him or her, you are doing something that's called the man marking. If you have the pitch of land that you're responsible for, not letting the ball drop, getting the ball out, managing players inside of that area, that's called the uh, zone marking. In the next lecture, we will talk uh, about the moments of the game and we'll see how the defensive and attacking principles apply to different times of, uh, of the match and different phases of play.